Hey everyone, and welcome to this webinar with uh, all of the five .NET advocates at uh, JetBrains. So the idea of today is to uncover the IDE that uh, you may or not or may not already be using uh, called Rider. And what we'll do is we'll try to give an answer to all of the questions that a lot of people have been asking during the registration for this webinar. Now, we cannot cover all of the questions that were in there uh, because there were simply too many. Although we will try to cover a lot of things, even though if we just touch on them, uh, if you're interested in more tips on Rider, if you want to learn more about how you can use it for ASP.NET, for example, or figure out how you can do go to type or work fluently with version control, then um, the guides, which has the link on, on the slide here, is the answer and the place where to go. And with that, I'm going to give the screen to Matt, who will start with the basics. Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining. I am, as Martin says, I'm going to start with some of the basics. Uh, so I'm going to take the assumption, really, and we're going to run this through the webinar, really, that uh, you're perhaps not necessarily um, a first-time Rider user. You've encountered the, the IDE before. You've got a rough idea of what's going on. But we're going to try and show you some uh, really useful hints and tips of how to use the the uh, the, the the product itself and get the best out of it. And the very first thing I'm going to show you is actually nothing to do with Rider itself. I'm going to show you um, Toolbox. This this is a really uh, very useful way of maintaining and managing the way that you um, install and use Rider. And it will basically allow you to install um, any sort of uh, JetBrains product directly from the Toolbox. We've got a whole list of items here we can choose. We can uh, install them directly, and Toolbox will then maintain those and keep those up to date. And as you can see, we've now got a list of uh, items which are already installed. I've got IntelliJ installed, I've got CLion, and I've got several different versions of Rider. This is quite useful for when you're playing around with um, the early access previews. For example, I can have a stable version, which I'm going to use today, and we've also got uh, an early access preview side by side, and so I can try them out and give them a go. Uh, I've also got a projects pane here, which I can very quickly sort of narrow down. It keeps a track of all the, the products uh, projects I've had open, and it's a very quick and easy way to um, to uh, manage my projects, manage my uh, products and my installs, and keep up to date. And with that, let's switch back over to Rider then. So this is Rider. This is the IDE. You're probably all uh, hopefully familiar with it, and um, I'm going to show you really. Uh, the two main keyboard shortcuts that are important as a bit of a survival guide, really. So we're aware that um, Rider has a lot of menu items here. There's a lot to sort of get through there. Uh, and my advice really is to ignore all of those and to stick with these keyboard shortcuts. There's two of them, really. Shift, Shift, and Alt, Enter. Shift, Shift is our search everywhere keyboard shortcut. Uh, and this allows you to search anywhere around in your code. Uh, and it's very, very powerful. There's a whole load of things you can do, and this allows you to get anywhere uh, you need to get to. Now, you might already be familiar with, with this from a different keyboard shortcut, and um, you know, maybe perhaps using uh, Control T or Control N or uh, some other key map. But I'm going to suggest using Shift Shift. Firstly, it's a really convenient keyboard shortcut, and secondly, it's a common keyboard shortcut. It's the same across all different key maps. And it's even the same across all the different products we've got as well. So if you're switching between IntelliJ and Rider or WebStorm and Rider, for example, then Shift Shift will be the same in all of these. So right, so once we call Shift Shift, we've got our uh, search everywhere here. You've got a number of tabs across the top. You can search for pretty much anything. We index the code, we index all your files, all your classes, all your symbols, and you can just start typing and we'll narrow things down and very quickly navigate around. So we can then select things and move there. So it's all very easy and very simple to navigate and find things. You can hit tab to narrow down the searches, to go between classes, uh, to read everything, classes, files, and symbols. And it's a nice way of sort of narrowing things down there and uh, navigating around. And you can then easily quick to quickly jump to the type that you're uh, you're interested in. You don't have to type everything out either, so it's very easy to start typing the whole name out there, but we can also um, match things based on shortcuts, based on the, the uh, short versions of the word there. So we can just use uh, a short version there, like memref, or we could do something like M, uh, yeah, MDR to very quickly uh, narrow things down to just the camel case versions, the initial letters of multi-word um, symbols that you've got there. And so it's, again, a very quick and easy way of, of navigating around. This initial letter, the camel humps, is surprisingly easy to navigate around an entire uh, solution based purely on the camel humps there. It's uh, surprising how many um, different combinations of the letters you can get that will very quickly navigate you and get you somewhere where you need to go. And so you can easily jump to the, the types that you need. 
and you can combine it too as well. So you can do a bit of um, camel, comp, uh, camel humps there with um, the, the finishing it off there if it doesn't quite match and you can very quickly get to where you need to be. There's a couple of other useful things you can do here as well. So you can actually type in a line number and that will take you to that particular line of a file there. So I can get to line 200 or something. Very useful if you've got a, um, a log message which is telling you about a, a particular line. You can just jump straight to uh, a line there and it'll uh, navigate you straight to, the, to where you need to be. Uh, and we can also do things like uh, narrow things down by namespaces as well. So we could do something like uh, MCRMD, oh no, sorry, um, let's do MDI uh, GSP. There we go. And so now I can uh, very quickly navigate to say, uh, get sequence points of method debug information based purely on uh, the initial letters of the type itself, method debug information, and then GSP for get sequence point and it'll quickly and easily uh, navigate me around. The other useful thing to point out with, um, with this uh, is, uh, where am I? So, so we can do a similar sort of thing actually, yes, with things like um, array.suffix there. So as, as well as just getting namespaces and that we can also do uh, a full type, array.type.suffix. Uh, and then once we are in a particular location, we can use the final tab here, which is actions. And this is really useful because it doesn't search your code, it searches the ID itself. So this will find all the actions that are available for the current location, uh, wherever you are in, in your code. So I, if I wanted to rename something, and I can't remember what the keyboard shortcut is, I can just start typing rename in the actions uh, 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 tab here. And the useful thing is it also gives me a keyboard shortcut as well, so I can start to learn the keyboard shortcuts uh, as well. Okay, so that's kind of uh, shift shift in a, in a nutshell. There's um, a, a lot of stuff you can do there. Very quickly gets you to where you want to go. And once you're there, of course, we've got the Alt Enter keyboard shortcut. So those are the two main keyboard shortcuts. With those two shortcuts, you can get to pretty much all of the functionality within Rider itself. Now, Alt Enter is um, really useful for when we've got inspections on the go. So you can see here, we've got uh, return highlighted here. And if we hover over that, so we can see that that's got inconsistent body style. We've got a lot of inspections that are in Rider. I'm not going to cover uh, too many of them. I'm just going to sort of point out that we've got lots of different kinds of inspections as well. We've got things which are for a style point of view. So here we're going to say that we want to be using expression bodied properties across the project. And so Rider will sort of give us a suggestion here to tell us to uh, modify that and, and work with that. Um, but we've also got things like um, uh, checking for null references. So if you've got a potential null reference, Rider will flag that up and warn you, and also things like um, new C-sharp usages as well. So if we can be using a different form of uh, C-sharp, so an example here would be, I guess, uh, use var instead of int, we can use quickly to alt-enter and rewrite that. Same with our expression body members, alt-enter, and we can quickly rewrite that and fix it up. A couple of useful things I wanna show you off this is that quite a lot of the quick fixes we've got, whenever we've got an inspection, uh, many of the quick fixes, wherever appropriate, can be uh, fixed within a, a file. You can do it across a scope there. So it's not just uh, one by one, you can actually fix a whole load of them uh, directly in a file, in the folder, in a project itself, or across the entire uh, solution. So by changing that uh, file now, we can see that we've got a change at the top here as well. We can just quickly check with the version control, and we can see how it was being rewritten to uh, change things there. So there's lots of different things we can do with inspections. Uh, let me undo that so I've got something else to show. Um, the other thing I wanted to show with Alt Enter though really is uh, Rider's got these items down the bottom here. These are almost always here. They, uh, whenever available, they're, they're, they are shown here. So we've got navigate to, refactor this, inspect this, and generate code. These are the other entry points into the rest of the functionality we've got. So uh, let's get up to the, the top of the class. In fact, let's go back to member reference. And if we bring up the navigate to menu, uh, menu item here, we get to see a whole bunch of options which are applicable here in a context, uh, in the particular context, for what we can do to navigate around a code. So we can go to um, derive symbols, for example, and we get a list of all of our derived symbols. And I can just start typing to narrow that down and navigate around. Or more usefully, we can do something like find usages. And Rider will very quickly find all those usages, can give us a preview on the uh, right hand side, and it can even group by how they're being used here. So, for example, uh, being used in creating an array. 
Other items in here, we've got things like refactoring. So for example, if we wanted to rename something, we can go to the refactor menu. And again, we can narrow that down. We can start typing and um, find the rename item and bring up the refactoring here so we can change it. And then that will safely rename our symbols across the whole solution. And the other items here, we've got things like uh, generate code, which is really useful for uh, adding things like equality members. Uh, so we can write a lot of the boilerplate code for you. Uh, and you can sort of generate a, a dispose pattern if we had some fields here which uh, would be useful to dispose let's do um, equality instead we can choose which items we want to take part in equality and Rider will very quickly generate all of that uh, boilerplate for us so again very useful and alt enter takes us straight to these uh, entry points of the functionality the other thing to show with um, alt enter which is useful is we can just start typing here as well and so we've got two different ways of uh, searching all of the actions that are available to us. We can do it through Shift Shift, or we can also do it through Alt Enter. And again, it's showing me the keyboard shortcuts so I can very quickly start to learn my keyboard shortcuts and uh, move on. Okay, so uh, one last thing I want to show you with when we've got warnings, for example, let's go to class one. This one's a nice one. So if we've got an inspection here, um, this one is all about uh, a captured variable is modified in the outer scope. So that's that's great and everything. I can alt enter and I can fix it, but that doesn't really explain to me what's going on here. So that's just kind of blindly trusting what's happening. So what we've got instead is down in this inspections menu, we've got this item here, why is Rider suggesting this? For many of our inspections, uh, for we, we see the, the squiggly underlines, you'll see a why is Rider suggesting this, and we get a, a web page then, which is telling us um, what's going on here it gives us explanation of what's happening uh, and a, a detailed um, overview of everything and also how we can fix it as well so that's you don't have to just blindly trust what rider is suggesting you can find out why it's being suggested and why you should change it and how to fix it uh, so that it works better for you and finally with alt enter then is that uh, alt enter is not just av available where inspections are avail is available everywhere so for example here i've got a, a main class here i've got a console app we've got a little gutter icon here so i could click that and run the uh the main item itself or i can use the context menu as well and i can just click here and run it directly there are other things i can do so if i'm at, at, on the public keyword here i can alt enter and i can quickly change that to private or change it to uh internal and quickly modify things if i go to a string literal I can change that to string interpolation, or I could change it to a verbatim string, uh, or modify things around uh, as well. There's a lot of different things that I can do. Okay, so um, that's Shift, Shift, and Alt Enter. Those are the two main keyboard shortcuts you've got to got to remember. From there, you can get to everywhere else, and from there, you can then start to learn other keyboard shortcuts that will help you um, move around quicker, navigate quicker, uh, and, and edit and work with your code quicker as well. So the next thing I want to look at then is um, is code completion. So let's just have a look at um, a method. In fact, let's just roll this change back so we don't spoil anything. Now, uh, code completion, of course, you're all familiar with it. If you just start typing there, we will complete for you. So if I have something like if is window runtime projection, it's there and I can hit it, uh, select it, and it's completed for me. I can also just start typing the camel case again, and it will match those and complete that. So that's nice and easy. Uh, other useful things are things like um, uh, import completion. So I can start typing INPC here, and that can be I know for, oh, that can match I notify property changed. But you'll see in brackets here it's saying in system dot component model. And this, if I select this now, it's actually going to import system component model for me there. So I don't have to worry about all the using statements. I just need to type the thing I want to uh, complete, and uh, Rider will find it and edit that for me. And now we've got another inspection here saying, well, you haven't implemented the members here and I can right click, sorry, Alt Enter uh, and implement the missing members and Rider will generate a whole load of code for me. I won't bother with that right now. Uh, instead, we will have a, a look at a different feature, which is really cool. This one's a slightly more advanced feature perhaps, uh, and it's, um, it's called uh, Postfix Completion. And this one is a little bit harder to explain, but it's a bit easier to, to demonstrate, really. The idea of this is that you start working with your data and stop worrying up too much about the syntax of the code, and you let Resharper do the syntax for you. So for example, here, I want to create a new string builder. Oops, 
so if I start typing string builder and then do dot var, uh, you can see we've got a little sort of template uh, icon here. If I click that now, it's created a new, created a new instance and a new variable for me. So it's a very quick way of generating and creating new code. I can also do things like uh, start iterating over my numbers with a dot for each, and I can very quickly uh, set up a for each pattern there. I, I can check to see if it's even, and I put an if statement at the end. So I'm worry about the condition and then figure out the syntax afterwards. And I could actually do uh, dot not, oops, dot not there as well and have that as a not and then dot if, and then I could have, well, okay, I want to return that now, so let's do dot yield. So it's a very quick way of concentrating on the data that you're working with and the variables that you're working with, and then let Rider fill in the syntax for you and build up the syntax for you. And there's a whole load of different uh, postfix uh, templates available for you to use as well. Now, um, the next thing is uh, is going to be some, to do with some more sort of uh, editing type stuff. And um, actually, no, I'm going to jump back a bit because there was something else I wanted to show you with um, uh, with completion here. So let's just undo that. I wanted to show you completion here because there's uh, a little thing down the bottom here. If you look at the bottom of this tool of this uh, tool window here, you've got a little hint which is useful. Press Enter to insert or Tab to replace. So there's actually two different modes of working with uh, with completion. I can hit Tab and that replaces name with namespace. Or I could do Enter and now it's inserted it. Now this might look like it's now generated an error, but it's for when I want to do different things. If I want to replace this with namespace, then that's, oh, <laughs> I have to use the right keyboard shortcut. If I wanted to replace it, then I can quickly uh, replace that. But if I wanted to simply extend that, I can use a different keyboard shortcut there, Alt and uh, Enter and Tab, to be able to either insert or replace the code that uh, I'm working with there. So that's very useful. So there's a difference between Enter and Insert. Okay, so the next thing then is a bit of editing, and um, we're all very familiar with uh, highlighting a line, doing cut and paste and moving things around. Uh, we don't want you to do that. We want you to do something a little bit smarter than that. So if I grabbed that and moved it around, I've suddenly broken code. What I want to be able to do is work a little bit more semantically. So we've got a couple of things which are useful for, for working with that. The first one is uh, extending the selection. So I can uh, use keyboard shortcut here to uh, extend selection. And what the keyboard shortcut is depends on the key map you're in. I can quickly look uh, for extend selection. On my Mac here, it's Alt and Up. Uh, on a uh, Visual Studio key map, it would be something like uh, Control W. And I can quickly extend the uh, selection. Uh, and then with uh, Alt down, and I think it's Shift, Control W uh, on window on the Visual Studio key map you can uh, quickly expand and shrink your keyboard shortcuts, sorry, <laughs> your selection. And once you've selected that, then you are in a much better position to copy and paste something a little bit more semantically. However, we still don't want you to do that. We want you to be moving things around a little bit smarter than that. So we've actually got another feature, which is rearrange code. And again, with the right keyboard shortcuts, uh, you can move your code as a block up and down uh, within a method here. So we can move a whole if statement like that, and we can move it down several lines uh, because we're moving it semantically. We're moving a block of code. What we can even do as well is we can push it inside a block as well. So we can push it inside the, the, the loop and uh, very quickly move things around. Uh, this is useful as well if we want to grab the, uh, if we wanted to move this line in the loop, instead of uh, cutting and pasting, we could just grab the uh, item, the, the last closing bracket there and push down and it, it uh, consumes then and pulls in that line of code and brings it into the loop itself. And uh, I think that is basically everything I wanted to show you, some of the basics, some of the uh, shift, shift, alt, enter, two bang keyboard shortcuts, a little bit of uh, editing stuff with the uh, code completion and postfix completion, which is very cool, uh, and then rearranging code, safely rearranging and uh, editing your code there. So I think now I'm going to hand over to uh, Matthias, uh, who's going to talk about inspections. Is that right, Matthias? Right, Matt. Thanks for that. Um, Martin is, is switching to my screen. All right. 
So yeah, correct. I will uh, cover a bit of the inspections, but I will also add one of my <clears throat> one of my favorite uh, things for completion also, and that is uh, working with string interpolations. Uh, you probably know string interpolations are there for a couple of uh, years already. And here's one thing uh, I want to replace that little text with a parameter that I get passed to that method. And uh, instead of just I'll enter on that string and we can choose to uh, move it to string interpolation. Something else that we can do is also here we can expand the selection and then do the curly brace and we have code completion here as well. And writer uh, will just magically basically um, convert that string to an interpolated string. All right, uh, with that said, I will actually switch to my inspections. And this is really one thing Rider and also ReShopper are great at. So there are a lot of inspections that help, can help us to uh, avoid potential errors in our code. Uh, we don't have to worry too much. It will always help us. It's like a, like, like a good pair programmer, basically. And here I have a very good example for um, working with enumerables. And maybe you already see the strings has a little squiggly already. And that is because we are getting past uh, we are getting past the strings as an iron numerable. So we have no idea if it might be constructed via um, chained link calls or if it might be already a list. But in any case, um, if we hover over that, we can see that here we have a possible multiple enumeration. And everyone uh, who has run into that situation probably knows that those kind of things are sometimes really headaching. And it's just really great to have someone uh, um, informing you about that. And what we can do, of course, is either to enumer enumerate the list or um, to an array, actually. Another thing uh, we have right here. So with order by descending, I remember when I when I got, got more familiar with Link, uh, this was one of the first mistakes I did uh, because the order by will do the first uh, sorting, but if we add another order by, then we basically override that sorting that we previously added. So instead, what we should do is, and we can see it here in the inspection as well, uh, possibly we meant to type then by instead, and then I can just uh, fix that. Um, and the instead, ah, then by, sorry. Um, and the inspection will go away all right then of course um .NET and also c sharp they are developing or evolving very rapidly and sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the different language features that have been added and uh that's something i i recently also read in the in the twitter comments uh, sometimes ReSharper and Rider are really great to actually teach us also a bit about uh, C Sharp. So, for instance, we might have a have a method here which calculates the previous to last element of our array. And prior to C Sharp, um, uh, prior to C Sharp eight, um, we basically had to use the length and then subtract uh, two. But with the new language feature, we can use the index from end expression, and that will just look like that. So that's just an opportunity uh, where Rider helps you to make your code also more elegant. Another thing we have here. So using statements can actually be converted to using, um, no, sorry, using uh, statements can actually be converted to using declarations. And again, we can use the uh, bulk fix and we will choose to do this only in the current method. Then uh, also a couple of async uh, uh, features have been added like async disposable and all that stuff. So we could also decide to make our um, method async. Then uh, additionally, we can also use the await using uh, or the await modifier to actually make it make it async. And here we are using the bright line method. And Rider knows there's also an overload which is async, and we can also confirm that. And that is basically both more elegant and also way more uh, readable. Um, here we have 
one thing working with I, as, um, async enumerables. So uh, whenever we are getting past the cancellation token, what we should actually do is to pass that cancellation token with the with cancellation uh, method uh, for the enumeration of that async enumerable. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Even if we have a custom method with, where we do a yield return uh, and which is a async, then we can also for those methods decide to pass the cancellation token. Uh, this is basically depending on the attribute that we have here, the enumerator cancellation uh, token. And this attribute, I will mention it briefly, um, is sorry, is part of the uh, is part of the JetBrains annotations package, and that helps to add a bit more. Uh, where is it? It should be here. It's not. Um, is part of the JetBrains annotations package, or maybe I'm just uh, too nervous to actually find it, but it's part of the annotations package, and that can help resharper and writer to um, even make more uh, smart suggestions around our code. So Mar Martin will uh, add a comment right after me, I think, also regarding that. Um, then let's switch over to nullability also. So Everyone probably has heard about the uh, nullable reference types, and um, we can, in, in this case, I have en enabled uh, nullable reference types only for the current document. And then, and that's the great thing, uh, we can go to one error uh, just by using a shortcut. And this is, you see, I just pressing the shortcut is basically uh, next error uh, in solution, and that will bring me to the next error and from here I can fix it. So for instance, in this case, I can make, since I'm getting the um, the middle name is nullable in this case, so I can change the type of the property that I'm assigning it to, to have the nullable version of string as well. Then I can go to the next issue. Uh, this is actually just a, just a, a typing thing, uh, but I wanna go here to person. And here we have a method which basically ensures that person already uh, is not null and that it's not empty. And uh, there are some, some cases with attributes, how you can fix that. But I want still want to show you uh, something to uh, express in our code base that we actually know that here we are not dealing with a null value. So we can either decide to use the, uh, I think it's called damnet op operator, Oh, no, a uh, null forgiving operator, <laughs> sorry. Um, but we could also use, for instance, uh, conditional access or stuff like that, or maybe even a fallback. Um, something else, and that's really interesting because there is another way of enabling nullable reference types. So we can also decide to only enable annotations here. And uh, this is interesting because in that case, we won't get the compiler um, uh, issues from, from the C-sharp compiler, uh, but it will only treat the, yeah, all the annotations like the nullable reference types, et cetera, the attributes. And what's really interesting is, let's remove that again. Uh, in this case, we have actually no error, although uh, the singer or default could possibly return null, right? But in the uh, annotations context, what happens is that writer will evaluate the information that it gets through the nullable reference types and attributes, but it will still enhance that with our own nullability an uh, analysis. So in this case, we know uh, we can possibly return a nullable value, although here we have person, and then we could just fix that as well. Okay, uh, one thing that I also really like, and Matt briefly covered already uh, the closures, is the heap viewer plugin. That's a plugin we can uh, install through the, uh, through the menu right here, through the settings. And we can see it is right here, the heap allocation viewer. And what that will do, especially in uh, today's times where uh, .NET Core is pushed so far 
to its uh, performance limits <laughs> almost, um, it really helps us to identify places where allocations happen. So for instance, here in this method, I'm getting uh, past a list of string. For the first for each, we see there's no underlining or anything, but in the second, since this list is treated as ironumable, we will see there's a possible uh, enumerator allocation, uh, which will happen uh, with the for each. Another example are um, method groups and uh, lambda closures, like we had already. Uh, we can see, for instance, here we have a delegate allocation, which captures the uh, the string parameter and this reference, um, but we can also see it um, when objects are being boxed. So for instance, we have a method uh, E, which takes an R comparable object, and we pass the number and we can see since this uh, receives an interface, it must be boxed and can't be passed uh, through, through the stack. Also, we can see it here with string uh, concatenation that allocations will happen. Another one of my favorite um, plugins is the Cognitive Complexity plugin. And many of you probably have heard at least about the Cyclomatic Complexity uh, uh, metric. This metric basically tells us how complex, uh, given a certain um, um, metric, um, how, how complex a certain method is or, or function, etc. The only difference is that cyclomatic complexity usually has has a few um, not so um, how to say not so smart assumptions about the code. So, for instance, a list uh, or a method which iterates over a collection three times um, will have the same value as we would iterate it one by one. So this is, uh, or what I actually meant was, if, if, if we have the uh, enumerations sequentially. So uh, this would be the same as we would do it like that, for instance. But going back, what cognitive complexity tells us is how hard it is to read a certain method. And here in this case, we see it will uh, tell us it's quite complex. If we click that uh, item, we can also see um, how much of impact a certain statement has. So for instance, the first only has an impact of one. The second, since it is nested, already has, has an impact of two. And the third, very bad, uh, already had, has an impact of three. Um, what you see here in the next method is if I'm using um, syntactic sugar of the language, like in this case, the uh, link query language, uh, which basically achieves the same result. But if I use those shortcuts, then I'm getting away with a, a very, with a much lower uh, complexity metric, since this is basically uh, easier to read instead of indented code and, and all that uh, things. Here we have another method uh, which works with the dictionary, a key and a default value. And let's assume the dictionary could be null, then we might initialize it. Uh, with an if statement, but here uh, we can already see Rider uh, suggests to use the uh, compound assignment like that. Um, a few weeks ago, I didn't even know this this parameter uh, this operator existed um, to make it more clean. And we already have seen that uh, we already decreased from uh, 40. Uh, sorry. We already decreased from 40% to uh, 20%. And here we can do it again. And instead of uh, the if statement, we can use the ternary um, Boolean operator. And then we finally have a complexity of uh, zero because this is way easier to read, I guess. Okay. Um, using the cognitive complexity, plug in with his inspections or any of the other inspections that we have, sometimes you might run in the situation where you want to suppress that you actually get a warning. Like in this time, um, I might be okay with the implementation of the method. method. Then I can just go ahead, um, go to the inspection. In this case, element exceeds cognitive complexity threshold. And I can decide to disable that in that particular case uh, with a comment. 
So I can decide to do it once with the comment, which is what I want to do here. Uh, but I could also do it for the whole uh, file, which is handy, for instance, if you're doing with uh, a naming where you can't work or where you have to use a certain naming. Um, or we can use disable and restore comments so that it's only for a certain uh, scope. In this case, I will go ahead with the uh, disable once comment. Um, but what's interesting also is that we can share those settings across our across our team. So, for instance, if I'm not interested in to, in that loop can be converted into lin link expression, then I can go here, configure the inspection severity. What I do then is to say I don't want to show that, and then save it to the team shared layer. And as soon as I did that, I can see also in the uh, local changes, and I think I have to refresh, uh, that the dot settings file, which is usually also committed to the uh, VCS, uh, has been changed. We have a new entry here. Um, and then also my fellow team members uh, will benefit from that. Uh, that's actually a really great example if we do the if we if we are dealing with the multiple enumeration, in that case, it might be uh, um, possible to consider if I want to um, raise that to an error, for instance. Although it is not in sync with the compiler, but it's still uh, a very good candidate uh, to uh, think about it. What I also want to mention is that those inspections. Uh, are not only a feature that you can use while developing on your local machine, but you can also in, um, introduce that into your CI pipeline. So I've written a blog post a couple of uh, years ago already about establishing a zero warning policy. And that will also cover how you can integrate um, scanning for inspections into your CI pipeline. So uh, in Team City, it it also works with with uh, uh, other CI systems, but in Team City we have a predefined step already. We choose the uh, solution uh, uh, file for that. Then the uh, analysis will run. We can also add additional failure conditions for the build. So, for instance, if the metric changes, and even if it's just the warnings, uh, then we can make the build uh, fail. And then we also have, especially in Team City, we have a nice UI. Uh, to browse for different files and see what kinds of inspections are shown there. Okay, um, going back to the attributes, I would like to hand over to Martin for a moment because he has something really cool to show uh, how attributes can help with um, existing ASP.NET code. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is an ASP.NET application. And as Matthias mentioned, there are these attributes that you can add to code to make writers smarter about uh, what it can analyze and, and how it can work. And there's a couple of interesting ones if you're doing ASP.NET web development. So imagine this is a standard ASP.NET MVC application. And in the right-hand corner of my navigation bar, I want to add a login link. Now this login link is not something that ships with uh, ASP.NET Core or MVC. It is something that I wrote an extension method on the HTML helper here, where I pass in the uh, controller and the action. And what it will do is render a link to either login or log out, depending on if I'm already logged in or logged out. Now you may also see that the parameter hints here say that the first parameter is a controller. And the second one is the action name, and you don't see any highlighting. We will only see that something is wrong when we actually run this application. Uh, so what you can do is in that login link extension method, instead of using the uh, standard approach by just taking strings, what you can do is annotate <clears throat> the, uh, the method signature and do something like this, where instead of just taking the strings, you can add the attributes, the annotations, and say, look, this string is a controller, this string is an action. And by doing that, you will see that, first of all, you get inspections. You will see that index is not the name of a controller and that home is not the name of an action. And if we invoke completion here, what we get is the names of all of the controllers that are there. So by adding that annotation, not only do we get uh, 
syntax highlighting and the fact that Rider actually checks whether that controller exists. But we also get uh, the smarts of uh, having actions and controllers inside of a string that we can add there. Also, by doing this, we can do a control click, for example, to navigate or navigate back to our um, to the view that we have there as well. So do explore those annotations because there's quite a few uh, other interesting ones as well. But with that, I'm gonna hand the screen back over to Matthias because we have some uh, teaming support coming up. Right, um, so one more, one more thing, yeah, I'm now sharing my screen. Uh, one more thing I wanna show you is um, how we can customize Rider more to our visual needs. And uh, I will start with the most important one, uh, and that is probably switching between themes. So we have an action here, um, also in the go to action menu, uh, quick switch scheme. And it's interesting, I just found out today actually, uh, usually I'm switching my themes through the editor color scheme, um, but we can also switch it through the themes uh, uh, point here. And what's interesting about that, I don't even need to confirm, but while I switch through the themes, I will automatically get a preview of what my IDE will look like, of what Rider will look like after I apply those schemes. And what's interesting also, like uh, some folks uh, might want to use the Visual Studio Light theme, uh, but what's interesting compared to the Rider Light theme is you see it in the background uh, that, let's go back for a second, that much of the uh, identifiers for methods and properties are actually just uh, black. And with the Rider Live theme, for instance, we can also see that uh, methods, for instance, are uh, having, uh, probably in a different file, um, methods will have this green, whereas properties uh, have, uh, have a different color. Okay, and we can, of course, and material uh, theme UI is probably one of the most uh, known theme plugins for that. Uh, if you have a account, uh, if, if you have a JetBrains account and you go here, you can even decide to install that plugin uh, from right here in the web browser. Uh, we'll tell you, check your IDE, and if I move over here, uh, I get the dialogue uh, to confirm installation of the plugin. So the Material Theme UI plugin has a lot more uh, tweaks that we can use to customize our, our UI uh, to yeah, fit uh, our visual needs, maybe even uh, with high contrast modes and all that stuff or, um, or any other thing. Uh, what else can uh, we can do is from the Go to action menu, we can also decide to remove a couple of things. So for instance, if uh, I'm not interest, interested in the navigation bar, uh, I have a wonderful switch here, which I can just uh, hit basically, and then the navigation bar up here is hidden. I can do the same with the status bar, for instance. Status bar is hidden. Uh, line numbers, uh, basically the same. And if you are really interested in um, hiding all your your tool windows and all that stuff. There's also the uh, distraction free mode, distraction free mode, and that didn't work because I have configured it in a different way. I'm sorry, uh, but then there's also the Zen mode, uh, which will hide everything. But last time I was using it, it I, I was showing some some tool windows. But that will basically hide all the tool windows and you can just concentrate on your code. Okay, then I can just exit the Zen mode again. Um, but there's also a shortcut to hide all the tool windows. Uh, that is one that I usually use. And you can see all the tool windows will restore uh, if I use that shortcut. Other than that, I can also go into the, uh, into the settings and for instance, search for white spaces and I can, uh, in a very detailed way describe if I want to show white spaces uh, when they're leading, when they're inside a method call, for instance, or in a string, or if uh, only if they are trailing, which is my preferred way, because I'm usually not interested in uh, white spaces when they are uh, up here. But if you see, if I hit enter, 
then I'm not sure if you can see that, but here we have several dots which indicate there is a, uh, is a white space. And it's interesting also that uh, for white spaces, we have the uh, opportunity to, uh, hopefully I can find it, um, to delete trailing spaces uh, when we save a file so that we don't need to bother uh, about, about white spaces. Um, what I also have configured, and uh, that was at least for me a very good decision, uh, was to change the tab placement to be actually none. So you see, I don't have tabs anywhere uh, because I really like how Rider can help me to navigate across my uh, code base. And with that said, I will hand over to Rachel to show us a few things about that. Great, let's take a look at navigation, uh, even though Matthias turns everything off. Uh, some people like to keep the navigation bars on or just to navigate with those uh, keystrokes instead of a mouse. Obviously, we can navigate by actually clicking in the solution window. Uh, that's the first thing people normally notice about Writer, but some of the other things that are really great about it is I can do a control tab. And when I do control tab, I get the switcher and I can go between any one of the files that I've been using, but I could do a control tab, leaf up on the tab while I'm still holding the control key, and I could either use the mouse or the keyboard. If you see right here, these are numbered and lettered. So if I hit two, now it doesn't want to behave. Oh, two. I'm sitting the wrong key. Uh, then it takes me to my favorites. Or if I hit one, it would take to the solution window. So I can navigate by control tab and then the corresponding letter or number. So that makes it pretty quick and easy to get through a lot of the files with a nice little pop-up. If uh, I do happen to open a window and then I want to close it again, uh, of course you can use the mouse, but if I do control F4, it will close that window, that tool window that I just had opened. And in this case, it was the uh, favorites window. If I am inside of an open file, I can use the alt left or alt right to move between the files. And as you see, as I'm doing an alt left and then an alt right, uh, you can see the tabs changing to which file and the corresponding code in it. Uh, if I just take the tabs off so that they're not shown, it'll just cycle through the files. You just don't see the tabs changing. Also, if I want to navigate a little bit differently, I can do a control plus F2, and that takes me to the navigation bar up at the top. And from here, I can move within a particular folder by using up and down, or I can move between folders in the folder hierarchy by using left and right. And as you see, if I hit down, it kind of brings a little drop down as well if it's not displayed right away. So I can navigate through this way as well to get to whatever I want to get to. So I could do full keyboard navigation if I want to. Uh, so there's tons of ways to be able to quickly switch between files. And as you work with Writer more, I'm sure you're going to find your favorites. Uh, one of the things that we can also do if I pick out a particular uh, method and I want to navigate inside of some code, I can do an alt backtick. And when I do that, a little navigate to box pops up. In here, if I'm on a function, and often we have pretty big functions or blocks of code, and I wanna see, you know, geez, where's this exiting? Here I could do my um, alt backtick and then I could either just arrow to what I want to go to, maybe the function exits, or I could actually just start typing like EX for exit, and it'll highlight that part of the word. Then I could go see the function exits. And as you see, it's way down at the bottom and it 
puts the cursor right on that line for me. So alt back tick is a really great way to be able to navigate right through code. Uh, so if I put the cursor on the name of the function, I can then get to its exits. Uh, alternatively, if I move maybe to a class and I do an alt back, back tick, I can then get to maybe different symbols, extension methods, consuming APIs. Let's say I take the consuming APIs here for this student class in an MVC project. Here it shows a couple of different controllers, edit and create, as well as the calculate grade method for a student. So it shows up uh, with all of the code that's actually using this. And then I can navigate to which piece of code I want to go to. Um, so it makes it easy, instead of having to be in a file and then use commands to get out of the file and go to another file, then scroll or page to where you want to go, you could just hop to where you want to go by doing an alt back tick and choosing the action that you want. Uh, so that's pretty great. Uh, another one that's also pretty great too is, uh, say I have this controller, student's controller, or even if I had, here's a better one even, a view, because we wouldn't expect uh, an IDE to connect code from a view to some of the models quite so robustly. But here, if I'm on a student object in a view, or MVC view, and I press F12, that's going to take me to the definition. So boom, goes right to the student class. So I can see what model actually gets passed and used in that view. So here I look at the code in my student class, see what I need to see, and then I want to go back to the view. I could do F12 again, and it will pop up all of my usages, and I can get to them. All right, so here I could go back to index or create or whatever. All right, so nice, easy way to be able to navigate by the symbols that you have. Um, other ways to get around inside of a file, uh, control clicks. So if I do control up and down, uh, you'll see that it moves differently. Also control left and right, we'll move it around between. Now here in attributes of HTML, you have a lot to navigate through, but it does take you word by word back and forth. Uh, control home, control end, takes you to the beginning and end. Uh, and these are some common editor uh, features that you might see around the world in various editors, but they work really nice in Writer when paired with the other navigation goodies that we have. One of the best things that we do have uh, is the control click navigation, and Martin showed a little piece of this, uh, but also anywhere in here, if I do a control click, on student, it's the same as an F12. It'll take me right to student. So if you're more of a mouse person, you could just do a control click. Uh, I can also go to, let's say I go to my layout and I wanna look at JavaScript even. Anytime I see an underline, like I see here, these JavaScript files, even the minimized ones, and I do a control click, it will take me to that file. So that's a great way to be able to navigate. Another way too is anytime I see an attribute, and this is very similar to what Martin showed, with the like ASP controller, ASP area, any kind of attribute that goes somewhere here to the home controller, if I do a control click, that's where it takes me. So control click goes all over the place between partial views, between CSS, JS files, uh, views to objects, back and forth, uh, all different sorts of places. Also, if I am perhaps using a tag helper as well, which these are some popular little items in the land of ASP.NET. Here's a couple of pieces of custom code in a tag helper to do some email. If I just do a control click here, it will actually take me to that class as well. So there's even things that are not underlined. You can do a control click and move around. So wherever you're at, just try it. Just try control clicking around. You'll be able to see 
where it takes you and bounce back to where you were before. So that's pretty cool that we have uh, uh, this very nice, easy, clickable way of being able to do this. Now inside of files, for example, like the create.cshtml, if you're working with something like an HTML or declarative syntax, uh, CSHTML, which is a mix of HTML and Razor pages, uh, if you're inside of that, the hierarchy can get pretty nested and they can get pretty large. You're often building very grand, complex DOMs. So whenever I'm somewhere in here, first off, you notice if I click anywhere or navigate with the keyboard anywhere, it'll give me nice highlights. So here I'm on a label, so it's showing me labels, all of the labels that I have, and they're in a nice, uh, like a violet color. Um, also, you can see different colorings, uh, like a light yellow here for the stiff, uh, a nice light green for the form, a blue for a different div. So the nested divs, it kind of shows a little bit different yellow with the one I happen to be in right now. And this gives a breadcrumb that has coordinated colors as well. So here on the label, you can see it's like a pinkish color. I can click on the div and it will take my cursor up to the div, up to the form, up to the outer div. So anywhere that I move around in these breadcrumbs, just by clicking, it will take the cursor and place the cursor there so that I can start working there. Anywhere that I click or move with arrows, same thing, you'll see the breadcrumbs changing. So everything stays in sync. So this gives us not just a way to navigate, but it does give you a nice hierarchy as to kind of where you're at in a file, which is really fantastic if you're working with stuff like uh, HTML. Uh, when I'm in HTML, I can always do things like an alt backslash. Once I do that, again, another hierarchy, and I just really can't stress enough, if you're working with large HTML files, if you're a web developer, that hierarchy for building the DOM is so important. And how many times do you end up missing a, a closing tag or something and it just causes all sorts of small problems. But here I can actually see the hierarchy quite easy. I can navigate with the cursor or the mouse, it doesn't matter. I can pick out that element that I want and boom, I can just press enter and go right to it. So Alt backslash is really great. But it's not just in HTML. Uh, if I go somewhere else and I do an Alt backslash, I will see that I can actually get a slightly different box here, but I can enter the symbol and I can find symbols that are related. And here you can see, because I was working with the student object, all of these items that you see in here, these objects and different entities are all something that the student class is related to or using, like the degree type and the grades and all of that good stuff. So from here, I can either type or just navigate with the keyboard to get to where I want to go. So both of those are alt backslash. It just works a little differently if you're in uh, HTML versus C sharp or a scripted type of a language. So uh, more navigation, a classic control G. Uh, if half the time I turn off line numbers, uh, sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not, and I guess it's quite a preference. Um, there's line 20, I didn't have line numbers on. Uh, if I did want to turn line numbers on and off, uh, Matt's already brought up good old shift shift. This is how I turn them on and off, shift shift, show line numbers or don't. All right, so that's an easy one for there, not navigation, but if you do want to use control G to move back and forth between line numbers, there you go. Uh, that's kind of an old school type navigation. Uh, and then again here, even if it's not HTML, control left, control right will take you to the beginning and ending of different words. Uh, if I do alt down, alt up, it will take me to the next item. So in this case, if I'm in a class, it's properties. If it's HTML, it'll take me to the next element. 
um, some other things I could do. I'm in here working and often you make a change and then you go off to do something else, you navigate somewhere else and then you think, oh I, I, yeah, I just changed something not more than 30 seconds ago and I forgot, I forgot what it is. Um, because you know, 30 seconds is a long time in programmer time. So control shift E brings up the recent locations. So we're stalking you, here it is. You can go and see exactly where you've been and what you've been doing. Oh, I see, I was working here in create. I could go right to that page and then continue from there. So recent edits. Uh, it's really great because as you can see, even here in a demo, it doesn't take very long where you have tons of files open. And then again, after just a short period of time, you have totally forgotten what you were doing just a few seconds ago. And folks, if you're younger, like when you get a little older, like me, yeah, it just gets worse. So I need control 50 all the time. Uh, some other things I could do with objects, if I do uh, control shift 11, very similar to the F12, it'll let me do a good a type declaration as well, things like that. Uh, also, if I do an F12 or a control shift 11 on an object that is a framework object, and I have access to that code, then I can actually go to that code. So Microsoft's code, .NET Core or whatever. So I could do stuff like that sometimes. Uh, so it'll let me do that. Sometimes, oh, there we go, external sources. Sometimes it takes it a second. Uh, so there might be a lag here with the video, but there you go. I did an F12 on an int, and then here I get to see what that looks like. So this is a great way to be able to go and see what's under the covers. So that's pretty cool as well. So once we are navigating around quite a bit, uh, we will make a lot of changes. And as you go through your development cycle, you're going to need to refactor. And I think Matt brought up one of the refactorings. Well, we have a whole menu full of refactoring goodness, and it's all context specific depending on what you're doing. Uh, so I, of course, renaming refactor. That's something we're doing all the time because naming is hard, right? We name something, ah, was not right. We need to rename it. Uh, so that happens all of the time. Um, so it's the same thing, control shift R, but then I would pick rename and as Matt shown, it would be um, a little pop-up to give you a safe rename so you can preview it and make sure you're not going to completely waste something. Uh, so I could do that, makes it, nice and easy and then just let it go and it does the rename for me. Uh, some other things that I could do as well, this renaming is taking a bit. There we go, okay. It was looking around for the code that is not there because there's not really a lot with the instructor object. Um, but after we rename things, we might need to move stuff around, particularly if you're building an object model. So if I look at, say, the code in my student, ah, sure, this looks fine. But when I come down here in the student.cs file, having this degree type, yeah, I mean, it's related to a student in that they're going to have a type of degree, but um, maybe it's better off in its own file. Uh, or in a file with a degree object or something like that. A lot of folks stick to one class or enum or struct or whatever per file. That really depends on your own standards and how you code. But either way, I could do a control shift R and I could say move to another file just by placing my cursor there on that enum. When I do that, it hints, well, I think you probably want to call it degree types. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. And just let it do that. And then boom, moves it right over, adds the namespace in and everything. And you might have caught it before, but if you decide to move, you can just tell it to move it to another namespace or out to a different folder as well. Uh, and as well as renaming, there's a safe delete too. 
uh, safe delete is the best because A, deleting code is the best. And then B, when you get to delete stuff and it, and then it's just deleting code is awesome. So when you delete it and there's no problems, that's pretty great. So those kind of uh, patterns that we use every day are quite helpful with Control Shift R, which takes us to our refactor this. Uh, some other things that we might do is, um, here if I have uh, an instructor class that inherits from a staff class, well, if I take a look and do my control click and navigate to staff, I could see, well, there's a title for employees and staff of the college. Uh, but if I go back to instructor, hmm, staff probably could use the department as well because they're all tied to a department, but they might not all teach courses. So they might not all have a list of courses with them. So I could do something like a control shift R and say, you know what? Since staff or since instructor inherits from staff, I think I'm just going to pull these members up and stick them in with the instructor. So I could do something like that and tell it like, hey, go go up there, right? And just do a next and stick them in the other um, the other object. So that's pretty nice that I can move things up and down that way. Uh, something else I might do with refactoring, big methods. And this is not the biggest method ever, ever just calculating a grade. However, uh, anytime that we're working with a block of code, we need to extract methods. So in this case, this is not exactly dry code. It's doing a couple of similar things that can be broken out. So, uh, or actually not single responsibility. So what I might want to do here is just uh, take this part where it determines the letter grade, and I might want to refactor that out and extract the method. And you'll notice when I highlight a whole block of code and I do Control Shift R, the extract method is what pops up because Writer recognizes that that's probably what I want to do. And yes, it is, thanks. So I will extract that method and I can also do local function, which will nest it inside of this class. Uh, but I'll just do extract method and it gives you a nice little preview down here of what it's going to look like. So it's going to create a new method, and uh, I could call it calculate letter grade, and I could even set the return type of what it might look like, and then here gives me what the code looks like. Nice little preview, and do a next, and then uh, boom, here it's in its own little method. So a lot of good stuff here with the refactoring. Um, but I do believe now Khalid is next with some debugging because after you refactor, you're going to want to run through and do a bit of debugging, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, before I get started, I mean, uh, it's pretty amazing to see some of the things uh, our folks are doing. Um, you know, uh, I'm learning stuff. I hope the audience is learning stuff as well. So. Uh, hopefully, I'll show you some debugging tips and uh, you'll learn a little bit about uh, Writer's Debugger. Uh, before we get started, uh, you may notice that I'm on Mac OS. Uh, it's one of the nice things about Writer. We get kind of cross-platform. I believe Rachel and Martin are using Windows uh, and the Mats are using uh, Mac OS as well. So, um, one of the things that, uh, before we get started, uh, I kind of want to show you kind of the setup of my solution. So this is a multi-project solution. Uh, we have a console application, we have a class library, and we have an ASP.NET application. Uh, this is one of the sample projects that ends up uh, returning a weather forecast. So this is something you can start uh, right from the debug or uh, right from the .NET CLI or from the templates. Additionally, too, uh, I'm running SQL Server in Docker, and one of the nice things inside of Rider, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we can see all of our services. So right now, I'm connected to my Docker um, desktop, uh, Docker for desktop instance, and you can kind of see all the containers that I'm running. Uh, the one I'm going to be uh, connecting to is our database, uh, and we can kind of see the database in our uh, database pane here in Writer. So 
uh, just so you don't get confused about what's happening and what I'm debugging. Uh, that's kind of the idea of this uh, solution. So uh, when you, you're starting uh, inside of Rider and you're working with a project, um, you might have a simple uh, application like this, which is a console application. Uh, it might be similar to a service-oriented architecture uh, solution or microservices. So uh, at one point, I'll show you how we can debug and call um, you know, uh, our web application and debug through those. But for now, uh, to work with the debugger, uh, you can come over here on the left-hand side in the gutter. And what you'll see in Rider is this little uh, plus sign here. Uh, if you're coming from another IDE, this is kind of uh, pretty familiar to you. So I can click here and you can see it highlight the line. Uh, we can add another breakpoint. Uh, one of the nice things too in Rider uh, for me is if you left click, you get this little menu. And you can do things like enable, um, you can uncheck suspend. So what suspend means is if our application while debugging hits this breakpoint, we want to suspend uh, the execution of our application. That might not be something we actually want to do. Um, so we can uncheck this and what we get is this yellow breakpoint, which is pretty awesome. So uh, if I go back in, oh, my mouse is uh, kind of sensitive and scrolling, so uh, excuse me. Um, but what you see here is a plethora of options that we can do. We can actually set a condition. And uh, just like anywhere else in Rider, we have access to um, autocomplete. So if I one equals one, uh, which is a silly condition, but we can do something like, uh, let me see here. Uh, um, well, I guess I'm not really in a state right now. So uh, let's do this one. So if I come here, I set a condition, I can say one. Hmm, I'm not getting autocomplete, it's interesting. Anyways, um, but yeah, you can set conditions. Uh, additionally too, you can come in here. Um, let's say I set a condition uh, to this, and then I go ahead and undo that. Um, you can actually restore the previous breakpoint so if you're accidentally clicking around and you undo a breakpoint and you had some kind of complex condition, uh, Rider can actually restore that breakpoint for you. You can also do things by, um, if you have complex conditions and you wanna move a breakpoint around, uh, you can just kind of drag it, which is, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's, let's get wild and uh, start putting some breakpoints. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite features, um, if you're somebody who likes to have a lot of scopes, um, scope blocks on a single line, uh, a good instance of that is when you're using link. Uh, if you come here and you click, Rider is actually smart enough to understand that there are multiple scope blocks on a single line. So you might wanna put a breakpoint on everything, or you may wanna actually step into and put a breakpoint specifically in one of these scope blocks. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. So, um, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start debugging. So to start debugging, there are multiple ways. Uh, you can see up here, I could hit uh, command, uh, or is it option, option F5, or I can just hit this little bug uh, over here got to move uh, the go to meeting bar. So I'm building right now. And uh, what's going to happen is we're going to step into uh, the debugger. So the first thing you're going to notice is this little uh, orange or yellow uh, bar. That's exactly where we are right now in the code. Uh, one of the other amazing things about Rider is as I step through the code, um, you'll see that the there's inlay values. These inlay values are exactly what the value of this variable is at this particular point in execution. You can also see uh, the values, your locals down here in the debugger pane, which um, you know is is the left hand side is are the frames. Uh, I know somebody in the questions had mentioned that. Um, right now, I have um, 
all the external code filtered out. But if I want to see that, I can hit this little funnel right here. So you can see uh, sometimes there's a lot of noise, especially when you're doing asynchronous programming. Uh, you may not want to actually see this stuff. It's just kind of uh, visual noise and uh, hurts your signal to noise ratio when you're trying to debug problems. Additionally, too, uh, since we're in asynchronous uh, in an asynchronous programming uh, application right now, um, we potentially have multiple worker threads. So if we click this uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we can hide uh, the worker threads and we can kind of step through and see what's happening. Um, one of the nice features as well is the writer IDE shows you the worker thread uh, that you're currently on right here on the right-hand side. So let me close that. Uh, one of the other nicer features uh, that comes with Rider is return values are actually automatically uh, essentially watched for you. So if you look for this icon, which is a little page with a return value, uh, you'll see uh, you'll see that it's down here. Additionally, too, we can kind of open it up and see what the result is. Uh, since this method in our um, class library returns a task, uh, that's what the type is. Pretty cool stuff. So. Uh, let's go ahead and step through it. We're going to step. One of the other nice features, uh, and I think I learned this from Martin, uh, it's good to kind of follow him on Twitter because uh, he's a, a, a wealth of knowledge uh, when it comes to Rider, uh, is this concept of pin uh, to top. So by default, when we have complex classes, uh, we're going to get an inlay value that's not really helpful you know, person, person, I don't know what the heck is going on here. But um, what we can do is come down here in the locals view, and we can pin any one of these values in to the IDE. That's pretty cool. Um, I know for me, uh, a lot of times I'm dealing with complex uh, models, uh, but there are really uh, a couple values that are real identifiers for that mo model. Um, you know, the the general ID property, uh, something that's super helpful for most people, um, but also things like name. So you kind of know, oh, this person is Khalid. That's cool. So uh, pen to top is a, is a really uh, valuable uh, feature in the IDE. Additionally, too, we can add watches. So I can. I know one is a local, but we might want to do something like, um, hmm, wonder, wonder if this is an e EAP bug, but normally you'll get autocomplete, but I'll go ahead and add a watch. Uh, and it's in its own pane, but you can actually toggle the watches in and out of the locals view. Additionally too, we have this evaluate expression feature which is really nice. Um, in this window, uh, in this modal pane, we actually have access to the current executing context. So uh, in this case, we can we can just set one to three because I love chaos and uh, that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you can kind of evaluate it. Uh, additionally too, you see the shortcut here. So anything we're evaluating uh, we can go ahead and we can add it to our watch window. So I just did that and I added it here. We can go ahead and remove that. Cool stuff. Uh, one of the things that I find really valuable, especially when debugging, uh, I might end up jumping around a lot of places and kind of get lost. It's like, oh no, where am I, right? Um, there's this little icon here. It's kind of inconspicuous, but what it is is show execution point. So if you were actually to click that, it takes you back to where the debugger has kind of stopped, which is pretty cool. So um, I know somebody was asking about um, asynchronous uh, programming and kind of getting uh, understanding what's happening in our application. So this is a task, and if we go back, ooh, see, using this feature already, if we look at this code, uh, I'm going to run 10 tasks 
uh, in parallel. And this can kind of get confusing uh, in terms of understanding where our code is coming from and where it's going. Uh, so uh, let's let's go go wild here and just run this. Um, so oops, oh no, okay, okay. Well, I guess this is a good uh, chance to also show you a feature. Um, let's go back to here and um, let's put a breakpoint here. Oops. I'll come back to that, but um, one of the other nice features uh, about Rider is if there's ever an exception thrown, uh, you, it'll actually break uh, on the place where we had the exception thrown. So in this case, uh, I was being malicious and I purposely threw an exception and Rider broke. We can use the Stack Trace Explorer and we can actually see exactly which line through that exception. So we can see right here is where we uh, have the exception thrown, which is kind of cool. And, and you can kind of walk up the stack as well. This is uh, really helpful, uh, especially uh, when you're doing asynchronous programming, um, you can kind of get lost uh, in what's happening. So, and sorry for the language. Uh, hopefully I haven't offended anybody. Um, so uh, let's start our application again because uh, I kind of jumped, uh, I think I put the breakpoint in the wrong place, but we'll go back here uh, and I can show you a demo. So uh, at the end of our next method, I've placed a breakpoint uh, and we're going to run, um, we're going to run these threads uh, in parallel here. So let me put a breakpoint. Let's run it. And like Rachel mentioned before, uh, if you look down here uh, on the tabs, there are numbers. Uh, so it's really nice. You can kind of bounce between, um, you know, you can bounce between windows just by looking at that number. Um, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna drag down here just to skip some of this code, which is another nice feature of the debugger. Uh, so if you just want to skip to a particular place, you can just drag to skip the code, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's see what happens. Um, oh, did I not hit the breakpoint? Um, drag it back up. Here we go. Let's see. All right, so we're in here. Uh, we can use the parallel stacks to see kind of what's currently happening in our application. Let me drag this up because I have a lower resolution. Uh, but you can kind of see our async state machine and what's currently happening in our application. Uh, this is a simple console application, so uh, this is not going to be complex. Uh, but if you're uh, working in ASP.NET, uh, you might see a more complex state machine. But as we step through, you can kind of see it change. It's always kind of a crapshoot too as to, you know, what's going to happen in here and what you're going to see based on uh, where you are uh, in, the, um, in your debugging session. So let me go here. Another feature I wanted to show, which I'll stop this, and it's it's kind of part of the debugging experience. I like to think of debugging not only around the debugger, but about understanding what's currently happening in our code. Uh, here you can see a SQL statement. Oop, that actually worked, okay. Uh, this, this line right here, uh, in terms of what I showed you with Docker, uh, is actually connected to our database. So up here, I had showed you, shown you the database in the database pane. Um, we're connected to a database uh, schema called basics. 
let me see here. Um, Mark is injected. And uh, what I was able to do is I was actually able to execute this SQL directly against our database instance. We can also do things like, um, let's see here, um, yeah. I wonder if this is an EAP bug. I guess uh, this normally works, but this could be an EAP bug. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm not able to uh, inject uh, SQL here. But normally you could take the SQL and actually edit it in an external file as well. Uh, some those are those are the features in terms of debugging uh, a single application, uh, but I know a lot of people work with more complex solutions. Uh, so one of the nice features uh, around Rider is being able to run compound projects. Uh, the way you do that is you come up here, you click Edit Configurations, and you can actually add a compound. Um, run configuration. Uh, you can come up here, you can find it. You can see that Rider has um, a lot, a lot of solutions uh, or a lot of projects that you could run in parallel. Here, I'll, I'll scroll and let you take it in. But one of the things I like to do uh, is run multiple .NET projects in parallel. Here, I've created a compound run configuration that will run our ASP.NET application and will run our console application. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, our console application is gonna call our web application. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. Uh, and before I do that, I'm gonna show you another feature uh, which is really helpful. Uh, if you come into the debugger window, you'll see these icons here down on the left. Uh, if you click this or use the shortcut uh, option command B, you'll see all the breakpoints found in our solution. It's kind of like the left click on the breakpoint, but uh, taken to the max. Um, so we can click through, see where all our breakpoints are. Uh, if you're using a third party uh, solution, um, maybe from NuGet, you may want to turn on CLR exception breakpoints. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, just in case you're using maybe an unstable SDK or something like that, uh, and you're you're finding your project just, you know, unknowingly breaking down, uh, it's normally this problem. So you can like check this, and uh, then you'll find what the exception is. So um, yeah. Again, some of the same features that I showed you before. You can log the stack trace to a file, uh, enable, disable, set conditions, do all sorts of things. Okay, so I have a breakpoint in my ASP.NET application. Um, let me close this so you can see it. And what this method does is it just returns um, random weather forecast. So I'm gonna uh, disable it first, come up here, run my compound project. I'm gonna start the debugger. Everybody needs noises, so uh, I'll be making noises. <laughs> uh, so you can see we're in our console application, Chrome is starting up, we've hit our web API, uh, not super important what that is. Uh, I'll disable that. Let's go back to our debugging window for the web project. Um, but before I continue, I think one of the interesting parts of Rider, uh, if you're coming from another IDE, uh, is the debugging in other IDEs is treated as one debug session. But what Rider does is it treats each project as its kind of own debugging context, um, and it gives you these tabs. So you can kind of step, you can kind of switch your debugging context for each project. Um, if you're coming from somewhere like Visual Studio, that might be a little confusing. 
Uh, but I do feel like this is a lot more powerful, uh, especially the fact that using this compound run configuration, you can string together um, different projects that need to run. Uh, if you if you think back to that menu that I showed you, there are things in there like uh, grunt files, NPM projects, uh, Docker containers. So super powerful stuff. Um, anyways, uh, let's go back here. Let's enable this breakpoint now that we've started um, our thing. Oh no, I gotta I gotta stop it. So here's here's another nice thing about the debugger and this compound run configuration. You can come up here, and let me see if Zoom works. You can see there's like a little two right here. And if I was to click this, I can choose to stop everything, or I can use to stop one project. So let's go ahead. This is the line that I wanted. I'll jump to that. Let's put a breakpoint here. Okay. Also, you might notice in the left-hand gutter, there's this little play button. Since this is a console application, we can actually come here and just start debugging. Let's see. You can see again, we're debugging both solutions. We've hit this breakpoint. So this breakpoint now is in our ASP.NET project. If I hit this resume program, we can see our console application made that call. We can also see the results. Let's see here. Again, moving through tabs, we can see the JSON result. We can click view and see that our JSON has responded back. Pretty cool, right? So I jump through multiple projects and am able to debug through each of them. And I'll just go ahead and stop. Uh, generally, I think that's uh, everything really around the debugger. Uh, like I said, I think if you're coming from other IDEs, uh, it may be a little confusing at first, but generally I find the debugger in Rider uh, really powerful, especially if you're uh, a polyglot programmer, somebody who's using um, not just .NET stuff, but stuff like uh, Node or Ruby or stuff like that, and want, need to run these processes. Uh, especially if, like for me, being on Mac OS and using Docker, uh, it's it's really um, it's really powerful. So. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, I know Matt was considering, Mr. Matt Ellis was considering showing some Unity debugging stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if that's still the case, uh, but if not, I think we can move over to uh, Matthias. So, thank you. All right, I'm back. Martin switches to my screen and I hope I'm back already. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> One thing really funny, I can I tried to convince Khalid to uh, show you the condition feature, and I think Khalid just missed that he's in a, a static method. But uh, what we wanted to show you was basically that if you're here, you have uh, auto completion. And what I really like about this thing is that even if you, you see we have an array of numbers, and even if you type count, for instance, then you will see it will automatically convert to length because it's an array and it only has the uh, length property. And then you can uh, can continue to write your condition. So you see, we, we also have the editor features in very, hmm, how to say, places where you usually wouldn't ex uh, expect them. And I will show you just another case um, in the VCS integration. So, um, speaking about VCS, if I want to commit something, let's go in this file, I can uh, view the changes just in this uh, diff view panel. And what's interesting about that, um, I can also deselect uh, certain changes if I don't want to include them, um, but I could also revert this part, for instance. So I'm only left with uh, this specific line that has changed 
I can um, change the the commit message here. I can even choose from um, messages that I used before. Uh, ASD is always the most expressive uh, commit message, as you can as you can imagine. Um, but other than that, um, I can type my commit message. For instance, uh, what was it? Um, at empty root namespace, uh, root namespace uh, property. I can commit. I could also amend, of course, but in this case, I will just commit. And let's go to another file that I have here, build uh, the build.cs uh, file. What's interesting about that, what I just mentioned, um, in this diff view, we also have uh, inspections available. So for instance, I was uh, messing around a bit and suddenly I have added some using statements that I no longer need. So even from the diff view, I can choose to remove those unused um, directives in this file. And I can again choose to do this maybe even for the whole solution if I want to. Um, one more thing I want to show you is working with uh, change lists. So for instance, going back to this file, we can see um, I added a part here. Um, and again, in the gutter mark, we can see that something has changed along those lines. But what I did is to add an API key, uh, super secret key. And of course, I don't want to commit that to my public repository. Even if it was private, maybe I wouldn't. Um, but things like that happen that we might accidentally commit that. And a very nice way to avoid that is to work with change lists. So usually every change that we do um, will, will be part of the default change list, but we can choose to add a new change list. And I will name this secret. And now I can go here to that change and where is it? Or maybe it wasn't from here. Or maybe I'm just blind. Uh, uh, it was not right click, but left click. <laughs> uh, but we can do this from, from very different uh, places. So even from here, from here, we can use the right click. And I can move this to another change list. I will use the secret change list. And that will basically, if I unselect that, prevent me from accidentally committing that. So even if I hit commit right here, you see, then I have only the default change list pre-selected and it's much harder to accidentally commit that secret. One more thing I want to show you is um, if you are very disciplined working with those change lists, then you won't end up in a situation like that. So I was, try I was messing around a bit with my repository and I have a work in progress commit here, but I also added a couple of changes afterwards, which are actually okay already. Um, so what I can do then is to right click a certain commit that is before that commit that shouldn't be there, which should, and it should be more on the top. And then I invoke the interactive rebase from here. So what I can do then is to very conveniently uh, reorder where this commit should be. Um, I could also rename things, like for instance, with the I'm using the option R key for rename. Uh, Windows users would need the Alt key for that. And I think, uh, yeah, if you click right, then you will see the shortcuts as well. Uh, so I could rename that, but I could also mark it as a uh, as a fix up commit, then those two would be merged, or I can go back and just use uh, for that. So if I start rebasing, then everything should just magically work. And I think I just uh, sorted it to the, to the wrong direction, so it should be the other way around, but let's fix that. Uh, so we move it here. That was a stupid mistake. And now we have the work in progress uh, commit right there. Then we also have the uh, commit, uh, no, not the commit, the, the push dialog. <clears throat> Here we can see uh, what commits will go to our repository. And uh, we can also choose to include text and all that stuff. But it's a nice view. It's a, it's a nice um, checkpoint, let's say. Uh, in your workflow, because then you really can check uh, what 
changes have actually been uh, committed or will take effect. And from here, we can also decide to uh, watch the changes again, uh, just to basically review all of our changes as a whole. What's also really convenient is the VCS operations pop-up. Uh, from here, we can conveniently change branches, for instance. Uh, um, we have our local branches and remote branches. I also selected a couple of favorites. Those little icons will tell us that there are incoming and outgoing commits. So that is uh, because in this case, I also rebased past the commit, um, which is already on the remote uh, branch in the actual repository. Um, and very uh, important to remember from here, we can actually use search again and then just uh, use the right arrow key and then check out or choose to rebase on the selected and all that stuff. There's one last thing I want to show you when it comes to VCS, and it's actually kind of like C VCS, uh, but not exactly. I will show you what I mean. Um, so let's just assume I was working on this uh, build file. And at some point I forgot to, at some point I forgot to uh, commit my changes. Maybe I tried a different way, but anyways, I kind of lost some changes that I actually want to get back. And this is really annoying if you if you maybe uh, cleared your undo stack or anything, or if you uh, even restarted your, your working machine. What Rider does is to keep a local history automatically. And the local history looks like that. It's, it's basically like an automatic repository that commits every once in a while but also on certain operations. Like for instance, if we are doing external changes, uh, when we commit something uh, or when we execute a certain uh, refactoring. But in between here, for instance, you see uh, I have committed changes here and here. And in between I had some changes like that. So, and I can go through and go to very old changes, for instance, uh, and then I can actually revert to that. And I can actually do that. But what's interesting here is even after we, we revert to a certain uh, point, um, this stack won't be uh, unrolled, but we create a new item which is called revert to. And if you if you're really yeah if you want to use this feature to some more extent, what you also can do is uh, use the local history. Um, and then put a label. So this will um, intentionally add an item to your local history for that file. And you can, it's much easier to identify uh, as, as compared to you, you looking through the list of uh, changes that you did over a certain period of time. The period of time I get, I, I get, asked this question quite some, quite a lot of times uh, is, is configurable. I don't know exactly where, but I'm sure you can either find it or ping me afterwards. Uh, but this can be configured. And I hope I didn't miss anything for VCS support. Um, other than that, I would give back to Martin, I think, right? That is correct. Let me switch screens again. There we go. Now, before uh, before I start this part, uh, I just quickly want to mention that we are already uh, well over time. So if you want to hang out, feel free to hang out because uh, we still have a number of things that we want to show. If not, also feel free to watch the recording afterwards. We'll put the full uh, the full episode online and we'll see how long it takes by then. Uh, also, if you are watching the recording, I am well known for speaking quite fast. So if you have your speed at two, uh, 2x speed on, on YouTube, then uh, make sure to turn it down a little bit. With that, I'll cover two of the big questions that people have been, have been having during the registration here, and that is, does Rider support WinForms and WPF? Well, the answer is that WinForms is indeed supported if you're on Windows. Uh, you will get a uh, yeah, the component view. You can see which components are available, drag them onto the screen. You get the designer, you can double click, you can do all of those things. So for example, if you have a form load and you want to show a message box, you can do so and say, hello world, and this thing will run. 
By the way, a really nice shortcut uh, that we haven't seen so far is that you can use Control Shift Alt R on uh, Windows at least. And what that will do is open up all of the run configurations in your current solution. And I have my WinForms application as well as a WPF one, and I can select them from here. If you hold shift, you can actually switch between running and debugging. So if I want to debug my WinForms, I can do that, or I can simply run it. And if all goes well, you will see a hello world pop up. So this is the most exciting demo that I have uh, so far. Right, uh, WPF, we have a similar thing. So I have a main window there where I have a lot, uh, lot of things in there. We get the XAML codes. We also get a XAML preview at the bottom. So what you will see is a preview of all of the XAML that you are writing. The preview is not interactive, but it should give you a good idea on uh, what you are working on and what you want to see. Also want to mention that the XAML uh, inspections and XAML features are probably more interesting here than uh, having preview because uh, we also support setting things like margins. We show those small things where you, I always forget what a margin value could be. Uh, if you add a couple of numbers there, you will see that Rider will add short prefixes that this is the uh, left, top, right, bottom. So you will see all of those things inline hints about what you are configuring. If you make it just two, you will see that as well. And you'll see that it's left and right and top and bottom based on those uh, inlays that are there. Right. Um, so I'm going to continue with a couple of more interesting things uh, that many people who are already using Rider may not yet know. And uh, one of those things is the NuGet tooling that we have. So in this solution, I have added a lot of NuGet references. And I wanted to mention that in the NuGet tool window, there's a couple of things that you may not be aware of. So first of all is that you can obviously search for, for example, um, benchmark.net which is a library that I uh, very much like. If you search for benchmark.net, you will find it. What's also interesting is that Rider knows about typos that you may make. So if we search for, for example, Beneshmark, you will see that benchmark.net also shows up first. Um, same thing with uh, camel humps that uh, have been shown already. You can also do B, D, N, and you also find benchmark.net because those uh, capital letters are in the name of this package. So that is there. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that there's um, there are a lot of filters available in the tool window. So you can filter on solution or just one project. You can select all of the feeds that you want to access and so on. But all of these filters combine. So if you are in your solution and you want to do an upgrade all of all your packages, you will see all of the projects there. If you select just one project, you will see that the upgrade will be just for that project because that filter applies there. Um, and what's also interesting is that you can search for packages in the solution as well. So imagine we wanted to update just those Microsoft.extensions.logging uh, packages that are here. There's no multi-select, but what we can do is search for Microsoft dots. We will see all of the packages that match. And if you now do an upgrade all, you will see that only those packages are selected there. So if you have a big list of packages that you may want to upgrade in one go, you don't have to always click that upgrade all and then go through it and select and deselect the ones that you want to upgrade or may not want to upgrade. Simply search for the ones that you want to do, apply a filter on solution or project, and then do the upgrade all and you will only see those uh, things are shown in there. Right, um, what else do we have? I have a little bit on unit testing, um, but I think we'll blog about that in the future. So I'm gonna skip that part and instead go to a more interesting demo and that is the uh, Sudoku solver that I created here. So the application that I have here is a Sudoku solver and we can enter the grid and for every unknown, we put a zero. And if we run it, you will see that um, our Sudoku solver will complete in a good 15 seconds for this specific uh, one, because what it's doing is a brute force trying all of the combinations that are available until it finds the first one that actually matches and solves this uh, specific Sudoku. So you can see this one took a good 14 seconds. Now, I think 14 seconds to brute force a Sudoku may be a little bit too long. So what we can do is make use of the built-in performance profilers in Rider. So uh, what you can do, depending on the license that you have and the operating system you have, and of course the .NET framework version you have, but typically if you have .NET Core 3.1 and Rider and ReSharper Ultimate, you can use all of the profiling tools that are there. What you can do is instead of running your application, you can make use of the profiler there. You can select between sampling, tracing, line by line, and timeline. 
where sampling is really taking samples, gathering some information on how long things uh, may take. Uh, there's tracing as well, where you can uh, yeah, get a good oversight or a good overview of the number of calls that are made to a specific method. There's line by line, which has more overhead, but does help you with figuring out which lines take most time. And there's a timeline view as well, which does profiling and includes some event tracing for Windows if you're on Windows and gives you some information on, for example, how long file I.O. or database access or network access and so on uh, all took. So all of those things um, are there. Typically, when you start profiling, you will select sampling or timeline. Now, I already did that beforehand. So let's open the timeline here. And what you can see in that profiling snapshot is, as I mentioned, a call tree of all of the methods in your application. You can see which ones takes most time. Uh, you can filter by subsystem. So for example, if you're interested in the number of weights on garbage collection, you can select that. If you want to know where we were executing link statements, we can find that and so on. File IO, same thing. But since this is a very simple application that simply reads this text file, there's not a lot, a lot of file IO going on uh, in this entire solution. Right, so we have that and we can now start and uh, yeah, optimize this application in Rider select the methods that we have there, use the F4 shortcut, go to source to quickly go to the source code for this specific entry in there. But all of this is, of course, if you consciously did a profiling session in Rider. Now, what Rider will also do is, on Windows at least, is continuously analyze your runs. So if you run the application, what will happen is that we have deep um, dynamic programming analysis running and it will show you a warning sign uh, either in orange, red or green if all is good or not so good. And you can look at the issues that it found while running your application. So what we can see here is that our application seems to be very, very uh, eager about allocating memory in um, while it's running. We can see that there's a lambda method being called and so on. So let's maybe look at this one. Uh, when you double click these, you will see the stack trace of where it's being called. So we see that it's pop next number, the method, but we can see where it is being called from. We can go through it. And what you will see in source code is that all of the call stacks that are hot or the call stacks that have excess memory allocation will be shown in, uh, in this orangey color. Now, if you combine all this, all this with the heap allocation viewer, what you will see is that, for example, this one, the pop next number one, that is allocating a lot of lambdas is actually capturing uh, the options variable. So you can see this in the inspection. And what I can do is alt enter. And instead of capturing this options lambda to use it or this options object in that lambda to make use of it, what I can do is convert all of this link to code because it, not, it doesn't really help to have that as a lambda. It's a, a little bit more readable. But again, we have some excess allocations there. If we would now run our Sudoku solver, what you will see is in dynamic program analysis, when our Sudoku solver finishes in a good five seconds from now, uh, what we will see is that eventually that specific allocation uh, should have disappeared there. There we are. So we see less information now. There's still excess allocations. There's more things that we should be optimizing, but this one is already very, um, very interesting because we already fixed something that we had in our codes. So again, profiling tools are there, but that's typically after the fact. If you have dynamic program analysis, you can use this before the fact, even while developing, you will already capture errors before even moving your application into production. Right, I think that was a very quick overview of a couple of things. Um, Rachel, are you around? Maybe. I think that's a yes. Um, I think we can probably do five more minutes on uh, on cloud integration, and sure. then we'll, uh, we'll probably wrap up. Right, coming your way. Cool. Okay, so if we're working with the cloud, there are, and specifically Microsoft's cloud, Azure, uh, AWS uh, has a little bit different things to it, but similar. Um, we have some tools called the Azure Toolkit to work with Azure services. And the first thing that you'll notice in Rider is if you do a file new project, you will see Azure Functions as a project type. Now, I've already created a project in here, uh, so I'm not going to need to do that again. 
but as you see, it will pick that up, picks up your C sharp and F sharp languages. Also, if you use IntelliJ, you can also do this, but in Java, because that is supported. Uh, once I have my function app, an accurate function is just that, a function in a class. So you can have multiple single functions deployed to the cloud, and they're set off by a thing called a trigger. So what happens is we would declare our function, have an attribute for the function name saying what triggers it, in this case, uh, an HTTP endpoint. So once somebody invokes that, it would trigger this. There are various triggers that you can set up and have functions running based off of what that trigger is. You can get to those by right-clicking on your project node and doing an add, and then you'll see all the different supported triggers. So everything from queues to Cosmos DB to the event stuff and uh, IoT, all the good stuff is in here. So once you have that trigger that you want, then it gives you a little bit of skeleton code. And we could do some things like mark it up with attributes. Since this is an HTTP endpoint, uh, here I get the authorization levels and everything that I can, if I want to use that. Also the methods like get and post, uh, then a little bit of code. And I can send out a request or a response to the request. Uh, either if somebody did not pass in a name like this function is looking for, then it would be a bad request, uh, or I can actually just do a 200 OK and print out a little name. So somebody would hit this endpoint and, and just pass in a piece of data, and I'm spitting it back out in this very simple example. Now, your functions could do all kinds of stuff from hooking up with Excel and Graph APIs and a whole host of great things on Azure. Now, when we're working with Azure also, in addition to just working here in the editor, you will want to use the Azure Explorer. Once you open your Azure Explorer, you can then move to your app services. Uh, I can see my function apps. I might need to refresh a bit in here. Uh, I don't think I've deployed this yet, so it won't show up. But also your Docker containers and hosts, SQL databases that are stored on Azure, and many other cool things. So you can come in here and manage them through your Azure Explorer. But before I do that, those are for deployed assets. Before I do that, I might want to test it locally. So easy enough, we get the cool little run button here in the gutter to run the Azure function. We can also debug it and uh, do a few other things here. Right, so um, create also would cause me to create a um, configuration for publishing. So I'll just pick run. And once I do, you'll notice the output in the bottom. And you can also do your control F5 to tell it to go ahead and run just like you would anything else. Uh, but there you see a little bit of the ASCII art showing up and some output and all of that good stuff. Now, if I wanna work exclusively in my IDE, I can. If I prefer to launch a browser, I can just click on this link and then start working. Since it's get or post, I could start working with the query string, but I wanna work exclusively in my IDE. So what I could do is just use a .http file, and I can do that by adding it just like I add any other type of file. It's way, 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 way down here at the bottom, HTTP request. When you add that, it's just a text file, but Ryder gives it a little bit of uh, a kick. So here I could tell it, I'm going to use an HTTP GET. Here is where I'm sending it to, and here is my data I'm passing in. So just like a regular query string, I could say name equals, and then the value, and use an ampersand, and keep passing name value pairs as needed. If I were doing a post, I can then declare the body in a JSON style format. So I could just come in here and add some commands to this file. And then I can do a run on this. And it shows up here in the output. And you can see that I did pass in a name, so it looks good. If I did not and I run it, then it should give me a bad request. All right? So here, yes, pass a name. All right? So it does not like that. So it does want the name. I'll undo that, run it again and it does check out. Uh, so this is a nice, easy way I can work with functions. I could test them locally 
And then whenever I'm ready, at any time, I can do a right mouse click. I could say publish to Azure. Uh, I can also integrate this in with Git and your continuous integration, continuous delivery. Uh, but here I could just come in here and say, look, I want to create a new function. I could pick out all of the information. If I click run, it'll take a few minutes because it does have to push everything to the cloud, do a lot of configuration and all of that good stuff. But it has all of the information I need. I just click run and then it will go ahead and publish this app to the cloud and then I can work with it in the Azure portal as well. Uh, so it does have that nice seamless way to go from local to actual deployment. Uh, so with that, I'll bump it back to Martin. And I think because I think we're running out of time and we have a few topics left to squeeze in. Right, so um, I, I guess we're gonna wrap up here. I'm gonna quickly change the screen back to me just to wrap up. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone because every single time we do a presentation like this, there's always those moments where you see things that even having been using Writer for a couple of years now, there's always those tiny little things that at least I learn as well. And I think that that counts for all of us. So thanks all for that. Um, thanks everyone for sticking around. Thanks everyone for watching. If you want more information about Writer, check out jetbrains.com slash Writer, follow us on Twitter. We'll post a recording of this specific webinar on uh, JetBrains TV on YouTube. There's a couple of other recordings there as well. And if you want to follow all of our advocates on Twitter, uh, you can do so as well because we not always post um, nonsense, but we sometimes also post useful things. So that might be an interesting follow on Twitter there as well. Uh, with that, again, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, you can watch the recording on JetBrains TV. Take care.